There is a lot to talk about today in terms of the CHL and the NCAA. That is what we are going to spend a good chunk of our time on because at, on the day that we record this, recording this on Tuesday, August 13th, it is the day after a suit was filed, um, a class action uh, antitrust lawsuit in the District Court of Western New York, the U.S. District Court of Western New York, on Monday. So what did it mean? What did it say? So basically, R- Ryland Masterson, who is a, a current junior hockey player um, in Ontario, has filed a suit against the NCAA, and then a number of schools were listed, including Canisius, Niagara, RIT, BC, BU, Denver, Quinnipiac, Notre Dame, Stonehill, and St. Thomas. Um, you'll notice that each of the schools that reside in the western New York area, um, those are part of this, and they are within the district that this suit was filed. So uh, just in the effort of full disclosure, uh, Flow Hockey, of course, is partners with Atlantic Hockey America, in which Canisius, Niagara, and RIT are involved. Um, so we have their games on our air. But, but to get down to the nitty-gritty of what this means, Basically, we knew this was going to happen. If you if you watched uh, many episodes ago, we had Brad Schlossman on. We also had Mike McMahon on, uh, two of the, the premier hockey insiders when it comes to college hockey. And we've been waiting for this suit. And basically what it's saying is by denying CHL players the right to play, to not play in the NCAA, to ban them, from playing in the NCAA because even if in Ryland Masterson's case, they played two preseason games in the OHL uh, and and had forever sullied their eligibility, that is in violation of U.S. antitrust law and particularly Act uh, Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Um, so this is a pretty big thing. Now, if you've been following the NCAA for any amount of time in the last, oh, I don't know, three years here, they have been getting sued all over the place in similar fashion where there are certain rules that have been challenged, amateurism has been challenged, NIL, all those different things that have come into play are largely the result of litigation. And this could be the next domino to fall. A lot of people had said, well, you know, the coaches don't want this. They don't want, you know, the NCAA coaches don't want this. And as Brad, myself, Mike had been saying for a long time, it doesn't matter what they want. Because this is the thing that can change everything. A lawsuit that challenges the the rules, essentially, of the NCAA to limit the CHL players. Um, I did have a chance to look at the brief. Um, and I, I so I've seen the, the relevant chunks of this lawsuit. And there are compelling cases made on behalf of, of Rylan Masterson and really anyone that is barred from the NCAA because of this. And among those compelling arguments, you know, it's it's the fact that the NCAA has specific rules for men's college hockey, where if you are, you know, basically the CHL is designated as a professional league by the NCAA, whether you believe it is or it isn't, the NCAA in its bylaws says that that is a professional league under their definition. Uh, There were references to other situations like the one involving Tom Olander from Boston University. He played in less than five minutes of game action over two games in all Svenskin. He did have to sit out two games as a result of that at BU, but did not lose his eligibility. And here in this case, Masterson played two preseason games, never played in the regular season game, and never, you know, never played at the CHL level again. He's now lost it and can't get it back as Tom Lander was able to. So that's another thing that that is being challenged in this. So just to give you the the actual wording, uh, the lawsuit alleges that that Masterson's lack of eligibility is the result of the illegal conspiracy in violation of the U.S. antitrust laws. It claims that a boycott of CHL players constitutes illegal horizontal agreement in restraint of trade and thus violates the Sherman Act. So basically, we have to also say this is a filed lawsuit. The NCAA and those schools have been served or are in the process of being served. Nothing 
has come to fruition. This has not been litigated. This has not gone to court. This is nothing is decided. So in the short term, nothing really changes. In the long term, everything could change. And I'm not just talking about the NCAA allowing CHL players. And I'm talking about a systematic shift in the landscape of hockey at the amateur level. We're talking that this this ruling, whatever it ends up happening, will have a significant impact on the ecosystem that supports the NHL. Because make no mistake, these players have to go somewhere before they get to the NHL. CHL, NCAA are the two most proven paths for players to get to the NHL level. 30% of NHL players played in college hockey, um, around 50 in the CHL. And, and so, you know, and about 60% are Canadian players and then 30% or so are American players. And then you've got a lot of Europeans. So this does impact the game at a, at a seismic level. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, it's there are another of interest, a number of interesting kind of situations that will continue to be brought up as part of this. But, in you know, to put it more simply, odds are. In my opinion, this isn't fact. This isn't reported. In my opinion, the NCAA is going to lose this case. Um, I, I think that there is a, a compelling enough case, and and it's not just because of this argument the lawyers are making in this brief. It is also because of all of the other losses that have piled up on the NCAA as they didn't really stand up to, you know, constitutional muster essentially, and have resulted in a dramatic shift in in where things are going. There was also, you know, we, we haven't been on the air since that ruling about the NCAA and scholarship limits and roster size limits and all those different things. And the fact there could be 26 scholarships across uh, men's college hockey and women's college hockey um, on a single teams, that could be a whole other ball of wax. So this is happening in con- in Congress with, with everything else that's happening, um, including this issue with the, the CHL player eligibility. So... Go back and, you know, listen to the episodes that I talked with Brad Schlossman, Mike McMahon about this and and about what we think will happen. I know Brad and I have had disagreements on what we think will actually be the benefit of this or not of this. Um, But the NHL did talk at a recent general managers meeting or board of governors meeting that this was something that they were going to have to prepare for. They were starting to brace for this. I don't think anybody realized how quickly it was going to come along, um, but it takes one person. And in this case, it was Rylan Masterson, who's from Fort Erie, Ontario. Um, you know, he's, he's currently playing junior A hockey in Canada, you know, and, and really he's looking for that option. And someone was always going to be first. I had somebody in my mention say, you know, hey, this is, this is just somebody complaining about the opportunity that they didn't get. Well, I think the other thing is, is that the rule kind of stinks. Uh, you know, the fact that you at 16 years old have to make a decision about your eligibility and, you know, you're a young guy, you're you're from Ontario, you were given an opportunity to play in a preseason game in the CHL. And maybe at that time you didn't even realize that by doing that, you would never be eligible to play college hockey. Um, but I, again, I don't think that that should be something that eliminates a player's eligibility, especially because these aren't games that are you know necessarily recorded um, beyond you know, what exists in media. So, so I think that that's another, uh, another thing is that, you know, kind of a bad rule is going to potentially create significant change in the landscape of college hockey, because it, it, again, it was only going to take one person to say what, what, you know, that, Hey, this is wrong and we're going to challenge it. So you've got that. Um, there's also a couple of other instances. I mentioned the Tom Olander instance. There's also Eve Gascon who played for uh, uh, in the QMJHL for for Cape Breton, I believe, um, played in, in an actual QMJHL game. She did not lose her eligibility to play women's college hockey, and that is because the rules do not include women's college hockey. So if you're a women's player that plays in the CHL, let's say you know that that happens again. You don't lose your eligibility. You can go play NCAA hockey, even though you played in what the NCAA terms, at least for men's hockey, as a professional league. So there's a lot of inconsistencies in the ruling, which is, again, why I think it's going to have a hard time standing to muster. I don't think that this is going to be. So what I'm trying to tell you is get ready because this is probably going to happen. And depending on how long this takes to get sorted out in courts, 
could happen in the near future. And that all of a sudden the NCAA doors are open to CHL players. It widens the player pool available to them. There are going to be other leagues that feel the pain from this ruling because the system as it's set up now has given you kind of these buckets to pull from these players and you will get those players and you can, you know, certainly the NCAA and the CHL are fighting over the same elite players. But I think you're going to start to see a few things that are going to change. I mean, there are things that won't change and there are things that will change. What won't change is that playing college hockey will still afford you the opportunity to play against older, stronger competition. It'll be a condensed schedule, which allows more time for off ice training, strength and conditioning. It also offers a bit more of an independent kind of environment where you're on your own, whereas the junior system more it's billet families and things of that nature. Um, Whereas college is a little bit more, you know, kind of, you have the college experience like a regular college student and all that stuff. So there are going to be players that are going to pick those routes based on that. The CHL will continue to have, you know, the, its ability to develop players as it has routinely for NHL, for the NHL for decades and decades and decades. And some players may say, I would prefer to play on that side as opposed to say playing in a junior league, either like the USHL or the BCHL or one of those. So that's another area. So those the decisions are still going to exist in that way. Um, you know, I think that the way that they develop their players is go- isn't going to change. But what will change is I think that you will obviously see a deeper player pool that comes to the NCAA, but it will be older, even older than it is now. And you might see fewer players choosing to go on what would right now be the college-friendly path going, you know, to a junior A league, which is currently eligible in order to play for another comp for another team. So I think that that's another thing that you have to kind of gauge. This is going to be a very challenging thing to sort through once it all gets there. The other thing that we we've heard the NHL kind of talk about and, and, and others around the NHL talk about is, is what kind of rules would be created different things that like, you know, if, if a player plays until he's 19 and in the CHL, then he can go to college I just don't think that's going to work either. I think that you're also going to open yourself up to more antitrust situations where you're not allowing players the freedom of movement and not allowing for, you know, the freedom of competition among rivals, um, you know, for their players services and, and things like that. So that that's another thing that I think will complicate the whole process. But as we said, the lack of control that anyone really in the NCAA is going to have over this. And the fact that this is going to potentially really change things for coaches and will increase the, the recruiting, you know, where you're not just recruiting against other colleges, you're also recruiting against the CHL for the same players. You're recruiting against the NHL to a certain extent because they're probably wanting to sign those players. And if they sign NHL contracts, how are they going to be able to play in the NCAA? Although with the way things are going, what, who's to say that you can't play in the NCAA with an NHL contract in the near future? I mean, amateurism is cu- currently being redefined anyway. So this is finally coming to hockey, and it is going to have to be dealt with in a swift manner, and it is not going to be fun. It is going to make changes. And the thing is, is that my hope is that whatever happens, whatever happens, then the players still are able to do what's in the best interest of their uh, of themselves – of their development, of what they want to accomplish, then that's only a good thing. A player having more choices of where they will play is a good thing. I think that that is is something. I do think that the quality of certain leagues will suffer. I do think that the status quo is not going to continue. And as a result, we are going to have to adjust to a new normal. And that is really unclear what that's going to be at this time. Um, But I am very fascinated to see what will happen with this. Does this also open the door for more European players that were under professional contract to come over and play in college hockey or in major junior? There are so many different things that are, are still going to impact the way this is decided. Uh, There's also international transfer rules. And I mean, it's a whole mess, but the fact of the matter is the ball is now rolling on this. So get ready because it has has a chance to change everything that we know 
about the developmental system and the developmental ladder of the NHL and how it's actually going to work is anybody's guess because the changes could be so widespread. So get ready. It's coming. You're going to have to deal with it. We're all going to have to deal with it. But in the end, uh, hopefully it works out for the best for the players. But this is something we will continue to follow extremely closely. This is something that will obviously have a very significant impact on what I do as a prospects writer, um, on on everything that you know we we look at and and how this will change that. It's all stuff we'll be talking about, thinking about. But again, it's important to note in the short term, nothing is going to change. But the short term isn't going to be much longer, given the way that things have gone litigation wise for the NCAA. So get ready for some real crazy new and strange things that will be happening. Um, In the NCAA, in the CHL, we're all going to be on the sidelines just waiting to see how it plays out. But as we've seen, college sports has changed forever, and there's no going back. So here it is. So get ready. 